And I think what happens for a lot of leaders is if they see that script's not working, they try to just go directly to edit the script. Like, oh, no, well, don't do that. Do this instead. But often you you find yourself giving that guidance to somebody and it's not sticking and, you know, they keep crashing and they keep, you know, failing and they're not, you know, maybe they're not listening. And you're like, well, let me just say it louder. You know, let me repeat it. And, and you're like, it's not landing. So I might ask myself, is there a belief that that employee is carrying that is blocking their ability to upgrade that script or is blocking their ability to adopt a new behavior? There's always more to what's going on than mere behavior. And as leaders, we must always keep this in mind. I'm your host, Tim Spiker, and this is the Be Worth Following podcast. On this show, we talk with exceptional leaders, thinkers, and researchers about what actually drives effective leadership across the globe and over time. You just heard from Lee Scott, founder and chief change agent at Unleashing Leaders. Through his organization, Lee leads a national network of consultants and facilitators who work with willing clients to inspire what they call an epidemic of leadership and integrity. As for Lee individually, since 1997, he has worked with 32,000 leaders and led dozens of transformational projects in the areas of strategy, culture, and operations. And, oh, by the way, he's the host of the Unleashing Leaders podcast. In this episode, you'll have the opportunity to hear about Lee's unique business model, which has not only implications for their clients, but for every one of us who wants to be an exceptional leader. You'll also get a chance to understand how Lee goes beneath the surface of mere behavior to help leaders understand what is really going on when they are not getting the results they are hoping for. But first, we get a chance to hear about some people and situations that have shaped how Lee thinks and leads today formidable uh, impressions where, you know, a lot of our beliefs and philosophies about leadership are, are made. Um, you know, got to point to the immediate family, of course, you know, looking at uh, primarily my dad, my mom, and a key uncle uh, that I had, and I could share a little bit about those. Um, uh, but yeah, my, my dad was in the military, and he was a career military person. He, you know, all the way through school, uh, we were a military family, so we were moving like every two to three years. I was born internationally, lived all over the country. And I think that experience of moving around to different cultures and contexts exposed me to many different ways that different communities solve routine problems and how they interact and show up. And, and given all that diversity, it also revealed to me that there's also patterns. You know, in every town, there's certain personalities or certain characteristics and everything. <laughs> like, And sometimes they have the same, like, oh, well, that's Mike. Okay. And that's Sarah. And that's Frank. And, you know, you're like, and, and they're completely different genetic origins, but yet they're the same patterns, you know, the bullies, the jocks, the cool kids, you know, yeah. the geeks. Yeah. And and so so seeing that, th- that repetition in different contexts kind of, you know, I think really opened my eyes to both the beauty and the individualization and the diversity of humanity and the commonality that we all share regardless of what our accents or languages are so i'd say that's probably one of the biggest things uh that hit me and then woven within that you know my dad was uh, he was an nco non-commissioned officer uh so you know he'd have 14 15 years in and he'd have to salute to somebody that was a you know 90 day wonder lieutenant a good portion <laughs> of his career he was in uh the, the law enforcement so you, you're like you had a military cop for a dad like oh my god how did you survive and you know when he when he was the warden of the jail you know i spent some of my summers you know hanging out at the prison there um and uh you know he was like look treat everybody with incredible respect and earn that respect back, not because of your badge, not because of your gun, not because of your stripes, but because of who you are and how you treat them. So that was something that wow. like he just radiated that. And I wow. think that's very in alignment with what all of your research has come to validate, right? Uh, it is. And, you know, don't just do it because you got the stripes, you know, now if you got to lay down the law, you got to lay down the law. But, you know, that's the starting point for any conversation. And that's true for uh, a tech sergeant that reports to you, for a prisoner that you're handling, uh, for a member of the community that you're interacting with. Um, so I saw that and he would have his entire team over to our house all the time. And, you know, their kids and us, we'd all be playing together and you couldn't tell who ranked who. There was mm-hmm. definitely a sense of community and a we and we were just playing different roles. Right. And so I, I got that from him. And then my mom, 
was a, this ER nurse uh, and, and, uh, and hospital nurse and recovery nurse. So I learned about compassion and servant leadership and really genuinely caring for your patient and knowing how to navigate a complex bureaucracy. And again, same thing, like we would go into work with her and, uh, you know, got to meet the other providers and nurses and doctors and just what amazingly, you know, intelligent and talented and at the same time, humble and compassionate people they were. So those were all role models. And we, and I had I had like fourteen dads and sixteen moms in, in, in all all these communities I lived in, and they all like laid into me and like Lee, when you grow up, you remember to do this, and I'd be like, okay, and I wrote all this stuff down. Um, so I got to kind of bring that all together, and that was yeah. that was just a fabulous you know upbringing. Well, it's really it is really interesting to hear you bring that all together because we have this idea that floats around a lot regarding the diversity of communities, the diversity of cultures, the diversity of ideas. And yet in the midst of all that diversity, what you also encountered were the things that were common to human beings, common to humanity. And so you're able to to see kind of all of that at the same time. What a unique growing up experience. Yeah. So yeah. you mentioned a key uncle. Tell us about the key uncle uh, yeah. that you had. So he, so I was, I was getting this through osmosis, through my parents and then other, you know, friends of theirs that, you know, leaned into us. But I had this uncle, Uncle Tom, uh, and uh, he was also a, a military guy originally. And then he went on to be an executive in telecommunications. And we were, you know, we'd visit and hang out with him. But he, he saw in me this interest and this spark. And so he, started sharing with me some of these leadership books that he had. And, and I, you know, went to his office and visited him. And he was like, you know, here's my philosophy on leadership. And he introduced me to like Stephen Covey and the one minute manager and some of those types of books. And this is like in the eighties, man. Um, and was like, you know, and imagine being like a 13 year old kid learning at the knee of this, you know, successful executive. And, you know, he came from a business perspective, whereas my dad was obviously military. My mom was healthcare. And, and it was like, wait a minute, there are actually systems for doing this. Like my dad just kind of did it intuitively. Some of my, mom but he's like here's a here's a system for it right and there are models that you could learn and i was just to me it was like the science of leadership that he really brought and so bringing the heart from my mom and the intuition and the camaraderie from my dad and then the science from my uncle uh, who i just got to visit he was just driving through town recently i got to hang out mm -hmm. with him and one of my other aunts i really credit those three and their unique contribution and willingness to expose me at a young age instead of just thinking oh you're too young to understand this stuff you know just worry about you know the routine wow. thing that sparked an interest that led on to all the way through high school and then leading me to get my degree in leadership uh, as a result of that. Now, you know, I'm teaching it, I'm consulting, I'm doing it, you know, my whole life. Uh, so that that definitely was the flick in the ear uh, that made a difference. What a what a convenient and easy segue for us there to get into what you're doing today. Talk a little bit about unleashing leaders and this. I mean, I, I do want to dig into that word a little bit because it's obviously important in the work you do, this idea of unleashing. So share with us about uh, how you're investing your your time and energy these days. Yeah, yeah. So right now, Unleashing Leaders, uh, we are a nationwide network of change agents. That's our role title. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're about accelerating the changes that our willing clients are seeking. So they want to make something happen in a deeply complex often involving some kind of, you know, integration between public and partner collaborations, you know, deep in the fabric of our society with healthcare, energy, transportation, education. So like really wickedly complex challenges. And we are bringing, you know, trusted change agents who have been leaders in these industries, who have, you know, been in and out of consulting roles, perhaps, and we're trying to help partner up and supplement these, these clients to tackle these really, really tough challenges. Uh, recognizing that, you know, part of our role is to coach and train and educate, but really part of our role is to run side by side with them and really augment and supplement their leadership bandwidth to get over these really big humps and then leave behind a legacy of leaders who are better able to then manage it and lead it and guide it from there uh, once we roll off and go on to something else. So I want you to go deeper into that. I know I'm jumping in here on what you're saying, but it's such a unique model what you just described there. Can you go uh, a couple steps further into how that works? And the reason why I, I think this is important for people to hear is not that they would turn around and copy your business model necessarily, but it would get them thinking about the intentionality of developing leaders. So I, I love what you, I love what your organization's up to because it is so unique. So, so 
you know, double click on that, go a little deeper, share with us more about how exactly that that works and what that looks like. 10 years or so of our existence starting in the mid 90s uh, was, you know, lots of leadership training and education, you know, practical exercises, but, you know, classroom based coaching, all of the traditional training development models that you would see out there. And, and we got rave reviews and it was wonderful. We've made great relationships. And yet so many of them were like, OK, that was an awesome training. But then three, six months later, now they're encountering a scenario and they're like, wait a minute, what did Lee say on day three of this, you know, 12 day <laughs> year long program? Right. You know, yeah. and so and I'm all about application and impact. Right. Like, how are we going to make this stick? And I was doing that actually as a part time gig. I was I was fully employed as a leader in a large private sector company growing the project management office and doing all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, so I was I was a practitioner of leadership and on the side hustle doing leadership education. And then one day I had one of my fellow instructors. I was like, he's like, Lee, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to find a product I can really get behind and lead a great company to do it. But I just haven't found the right product. And he was like, Lee, leadership is your product. Like, <laughs> just do that. You've got 8,000 followers. Like, what the hell is wrong with you, man? <laughs> this is- this is, I'm sorry, I'm going to, I'm in my mind right now, I'm in Back to the Future and I'm hearing, hello, McFly. Hello, McFly. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of that. Yeah. Great. Well, thank goodness for people who point out obvious things to us, that, right? Stunningly obvious, right? <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, I, yeah, why not? And I reached out to a bunch of, you know, folks, and this was right as the Great Recession was really mm. crushing everybody. And I'm just like, who in the world's going to want to spend money on leadership training right now? Mm-hmm. And when I reached out to him, I instantly had a backlog of like a year and a half of work. Wow. Uh, and, and all the other consultants that were getting, you know, their contracts cut and laid off. I was like, guys, I got more work than I can handle. Come help me. But <laughs> but what we decided to do differently was they didn't just want a coach and they just didn't want training. They wanted somebody that was willing to roll up their sleeves and partner up with them. Uh, and so we then, you know, the idea was, OK, hey, let us temporarily come in to support you in this great crisis and in this turmoil and supplement and clarify what the strategy was and bring some of the um, you know process alignment that needed to happen in a very rapid order with folks who had been there, done that in the prior dot com crash and in the prior you know challenges of the 90s, you know, because. In many people's career as a leader, you might see two or three of these real peak transformational type projects, whether it's responding to a crisis or it's implementing a major new strategy, you might see three in your career. Like that's a lot, yeah. you know, but we were tapping into folks as like, oh, we'd seen 20 or 30 of them yep. and we stepped on all the rakes and made a ton of mistakes. And we we're like, okay, hey, you know, rather than us behind the scenes kind of pointing out and suggesting, you know, let's saddle up right next to you uh, and actually help you get through this. Uh, and we can be in front and take the arrows. We can be beside and co-pilot. We can be right behind and back you up. That's up to the client to decide. Uh, but we're there to supplement through that period of time and the whole time. And then and then at the end, it's not like, OK, here's a bunch of knowledge transfer dumped at the end. It's like, no, we've been developing and coaching mm-hmm. and sharing why we're doing what we're doing in that moment with those those fellow leaders along the way so that that collapses their leadership development and into a much tighter, shorter time frame. Uh, and then they are unleashed. Right. They go on. And, and then the great part of this is they grow up, they get promoted. Next thing, the next time they're in a fight, who are they going to call? Yeah. Right. And so we yeah. never worry about rolling off of a client. We're like, we're always trying to get ourselves out of a job mm-hmm. with that client because we know there's going to be another challenge. There's going to be another opportunity. There's way more work that needs to be done than we could ever possibly solve. And we're when we're happy to share that with other other colleagues, other subcontractors, whoever. Yeah. So what I hear is this really creative combination of fractional participation for a time period around a very intense topic initiative issue that's going on and oh by the way we're not going to help you we're not going to help you just survive this moment or we're not going to help you just thrive in this moment we're also going to equip you such that the leadership development conversation is continuously happening through this opportunity through this crisis through this issue such that when we roll out of here you're not just in a better spot for the moment, but you're set up better for the future. It's tough. I I mean, that's unusual in the consulting world. I mean, when we look at our big, you know, friends in this space, because, you know, sometimes we compete, sometimes we collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, But often the model in many consulting firms, they're looking for an annuity, 
right? You know, where and, and that they are dependent on them and they they need to continue to need them. And there's value in that. And there's certain things that I have no no disrespect for that. I might early in my career, I was a worked for a big consulting firm and I understood that. But our philosophy is a little bit different. And then we're like, well, we want them to not need us because isn't that what leadership is about, right? Mm-hmm. It's about elevating folks so that they're able to do more on their own than they ever could do, you know, with or, or or under you. And that's hard because we have to be constantly replenishing, you know, that pipeline. And it's and it's harder to find the right kind of people to do that kind of work. So, but I, that's the place we want to play in. So that's where we live. Well, what I love about your business strategy, besides the fact that it's very unique and I think would be appealing to a lot of organizations, is that I think it's also a challenge to the leader in in any organization, any leader who might be listening. And what I, what I mean by that is any leader who's listening, you could probably go right now to your list of initiatives and efforts that need to get done. What are the big rocks that we're trying to move right now? Mm-hmm. And we can get really focused on those big rocks. And that's fine. We need to be focused on them. But oh, by the way, do we also remember that our job is to equip and enable while we're getting the work done? Do I see it that because in your business model, if they're not ready to better run by themselves on their own two legs when you're done, then you haven't fully done your job. Here's the news flash for all of us. That's all of our jobs as leaders. Yeah, (laughs) that is what we're all supposed to be up to. Yes, we have to get the project done. Yes, we have to solve the big problem that's at hand. But if we are not taking the leaders that we are influencing, that report to us through mm-hmm. these organizations and not making them more well-equipped to lead on their own without us after this, then we are not doing the fullness of leadership. We're not leading. We're, we're, we might be doing something valuable, but it is not <laughs> leading, <laughs> right? You're making them dependent, right? And that's, yes. you know, sure, sure. You know, there's a lot of drugs out there that people are dependent on. It doesn't mean they're necessarily helping. What's funny is uh, that they often feel good for the moment, right? But they're actually yeah. damaging us for the long haul. And perhaps yeah. there's a little bit of a and, little bit of a parallel there. And we're not rejecting uh, long-term relationships. We've had several long-term relationships, but the whole thing is that we want to work on different things. Like we don't want to just be keep doing the same thing we've always been doing. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, we got over that problem. Now there's a new problem. Now there's a new generation. You know, somebody promoted, somebody retired. You know, so that's fine. Um, but yeah, we are interested in again unleashing leaders so that they can stand on their own. And that really reminds me of again going back to those formative years. Being in a mobile home park in the middle of Indiana, you know, as like a kindergartner ish kid, pre K, K, right? And I learned to ride a bike at that stage. So, Tim, think about it. Like when you re- learned to ride a bike, I'm assuming what you did is you got a book and you watched a YouTube video, right? And then you had somebody. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that how you learned to ride a bike? First of all, let me say thank you for you supposing that YouTube was around was I was, when I was a kid. So, let me, <laughs> let me first say thank you for that. Um, yeah, there was not a lot of video watching or book reading or YouTube being involved in my learning how to ride a bike. So how did you learn how to ride a bike? I got on a bike and it was not awesome at first. And then over time, you picked it up. And then, you know, after a little while, we were riding. Yeah, but you had to crash a few times, right? Yeah. Now I I was fortunate. I, you know, so we started with the training wheels, you know, it had the crash, but there was a there was a point. When I was in the middle, like it was off the training wheels, but I wasn't able to be on two wheels. And I remember vividly in this little mobile home uh, park with my my mom, you know, cheering me on and my dad holding on to the back end of my banana seat, running yeah. his heart out. Right. As yeah. he was he was holding me up while I was getting speed. Right. And so he's running alongside of me, holding me. And then he let me go. Yeah. Right. And I was like, I got it. I got it. <laughs> I don't got it. Bam. Right. And I bit it hard. Right. And it's like, you know, and, and there's so many parallels to, mm-hmm. I think, leadership development with that. Right. It's like, you know, there are many things you can learn in a classroom, you know, math, history, by all means, knock those, those things out. Right. You know, but when it comes to something that is as personal and as encompassing as a skill like leadership, right, being able to have somebody that is there that runs alongside you for a little bit, lets you crash, 
sprays off the, you know, the wounds, gets you back on that bike mm-hmm. and pushes you again. And it's it's one of those things like, yeah, and it's just like leadership. When you've got momentum and everything's flowing, leadership is easy. It's just like riding a bike. It's easy when you're going fast. Mm-hmm. But then when leadership, you know, hits those bumps and has speed bumps, you're going through gravel, right? Then leadership becomes harder to do and you're more likely to crash. But, you know, sooner or later, you learn how to handle that tough terrain. But having that mom or dad or uncle or big sister or brother, you know, holding that seat for just a little bit, that really accelerates your learning and doesn't get you to quit either because we need more leaders knowing mm-hmm. how to lead just like we need more of an impact in these communities such a it's such a beautiful picture all the way around because a so many of us have had an experience similar to the one that you described where a parent or a friend or an aunt or an uncle was running alongside of us and at some point they let go and we were trying to figure out like, did they let go yet? Am I, am I on my own? Wait, I think I'm on my is own. It really is, 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 am, am I really <laughs> doing this? Yeah. Many of us yeah. viscerally had that experience, but then to take it over in this parallel universe and talk about how that applies to leadership, you know, that's a, that's basically a Norman Rockwell parenting picture that, yeah. that most of us can, whether we experienced it personally or not, most of us, can imagine that and see the beauty in it and see the value in it. And now you're Mm -hmm. saying, what if we thought about leadership in that same way? And it's such a wonderful, it's like, wow, I got all kind of warm and fuzzy thinking about that picture of you with your dad running alongside. What if we just took that, we, we fast forwarded it about, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. And now we're doing the same thing with leaders metaphorically isn't that yeah. also a beautiful picture? Isn't that also a little bit of healthy Norman Rockwell? And to your point, there are going to be crashes. But here's the thing. You don't learn how to ride a bike next to a 10,000-foot cliff. That's a bad place to learn how to ride a no. bike, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, <laughs> and so as we come alongside people, we know the terrain. We know that, yeah, you might scrape your knee, but but we're not going to learn in an environment that could be fatal for you or the organization. And so, yes, there might be some bumps and scrapes. There probably will be. But the leader is going to look out and say, OK, this is a good environment in which to practice. Um, this is a place where the, the damage will not be too big if it doesn't go well. Yeah. And we can yeah. learn. So I that that picture that's going to stick with me the rest of the day, my friend. And I, I love pulling what is so good about a picture like that into our adult space as <clears throat> learners and leaders moving forward to develop other leaders. I just love it. It's great. Yeah. There is a time to lead in front, right? Where like you know you're on a cross country bike, you know, ride with you know on your motorcycle. Like yeah, you got the you know person that's out in front, and the, yeah. and then you got the then you got the person playing sweep. There's a time to lead in the front. There's a time to lead from the rear. Uh, I, but I think when it talks about like expanding leadership capacity, which I think every organization would benefit, you know, whether it's improved customer outcomes, improved revenue, whatever it is, improved community impact. If you're a nonprofit, you know, expanding that leadership capacity, if that's your goal in that moment to get access to it, then having a leader from the side mm. is, is, the, is, I think, the right kind of leadership in that moment. Yeah. Wow. What a great picture. What a great picture. I know you've got some thoughts about this idea of limiting beliefs. And so I want us to take a little bit of time as we switch gears to to talk about that. And sorry, I wasn't meaning to make another bike analogy with the switch gears comment there, but <laughs> it just sometimes these things just happen. All right. So we're, so we're, we're going to switch gears. There's language around everything. And language can be so powerful in terms of where it takes us or where it keeps us from going. Talk a little bit about the syntax around this idea of limiting beliefs. Sure, sure. Limiting beliefs are kind of like the, think of that as the operating system, you know, in our brain. Um, you know, on, on on top of the operating system runs like Word and Google Photos and Facebook <laughs> or whatever. Like those are the applications. So those are the behaviors, right? The limiting beliefs are like the operating system that those behaviors run on. Okay. So when you look at the code for an operating system, it's it's a little different than the code for the application. So from a leadership perspective, a limiting belief has a structure of, you know, if this condition or situation or whatever, then this will be the outcome or the consequence. And that could be good or bad. Like if you do this thing, then good things will happen. Or if you do this thing, then a bad thing will happen. Mm-hmm. And then there's a therefore clause that says, therefore, you should do this or you should avoid this. Okay. So that's kind of the syntax of a limiting belief, you know. So if I 
touch the stove, then I could get burned. Therefore, avoid the stove. Okay. Right. Okay. Or, or if I go into this meeting and I'm not sufficiently prepared, then I could look like a fool, lose my job, end up homeless. Therefore, postpone the meeting. Mm. Right. Mm. So yeah. the behavior then is, you know, postpone the meeting, do all these other things, but the belief is what's driving that behavior, right? And so uh, an evolved belief might look like, okay, yes, if I go in there and I just wing it, then a bad thing could happen, you know? However, I've got all these other great skills and transferable knowledge, and if I prepare adequately, it may not be perfect, but I can at least move the ball forward. Mm. Therefore, you can schedule the meeting now. Yeah. Right. And wow. so it's an it's yeah. an evolved belief. And now your operating system has expanded. So now you can run new applications on that expanded operating system. But if you're running MS DOS <laughs> and you're trying to play, you know, Candy Crush, Game of Thrones, or whatever it is, right? Yeah, it's like it, it's gonna crash. <laughs> <laughs> it's and, really, it's really good. I, I think the idea of asking that question of ourselves, wait a second. It's almost like taking instant replay in a sporting event and going slow motion, mm -hmm. slow motion on what I was thinking around this. And then at any point, just like the commentators, be like, they'll say, OK, hit pause, hit pause right here. And, and you're looking at the picture and they're circling things on the telestrator. Yes. It's that yes. same idea, except mm -hmm. with leading, with with doing, with performing and saying, OK, wait, I've got a choice now. And the reason I've got a choice is because I've slowed the story down to identify the belief and asking myself, okay, really, 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 is that true all the time? Really, really, is that for sure what's going to happen? And then you just pose the scenario like, well, actually, I'm fairly knowledgeable to begin with. Maybe I don't know everything, but as you said, it's sufficient to move the ball down the field. So let's go ahead and have the meeting. But it was that slowing down that allowed mm -hmm. me to kind of address mm -hmm. that, that belief mm -hmm. or see it, even see that it existed. That's great. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it really plays into, I mean, your whole being and purpose with you know your business in the show is be worth following. Right. And yes. so let, let's presume that in this moment, yeah, we think it makes sense to have that parallel leadership uh, support, whether that's an internal mentor or whatever. Um, then, then the question becomes naturally, okay, well, how do I do that? Like, what is the equivalent of me holding onto the back seat of that bike? Mm -hmm while I'm running alongside them. What am, what am I looking for and what am I trying to help them uh, to overcome? My in the trenches provincial perspective of it is, is on the one hand, there is you know, who you purport to be, right? That's what your social media looks like and all this other nonsense, right? And then on the very other end of the extreme is you know, being a man of faith, that's your soul, mm -hmm. right? Like that, that's your true essence. And, and in between there, there's a whole bunch of layers and, and, and interesting things, but I, I pull out kind of two layers that I think are relevant from a leadership perspective. One is your behavior, right? Those are the scripts that you're running and how you solve problems and how you approach things and, and, the, and the way you respond to certain, you know, stimulus and conditions, you know, those are your behaviors. Those are your scripts. So there's your, the one you purport to be, then there's how you're actually behaving in a routine fashion, you know, your habits, as it were, Stephen Covey or Atomic Habits, whoever, whoever you want to look to there. But then between the behavior and your soul is a layer that I call your beliefs, right? It's who do you believe to be and what do you believe about the universe? And I, and I have to give credit. I learned a lot about this from Tony Robbins and some personal work I got to do with him, which was amazing. Mm. Uh, but when you look at those beliefs, so if you kind of stack it up, you know, in this situation, I'm going to do this script that I that I wrote at some point in my life. Maybe I I borrowed it from a family member or early you know career experience. But I wrote this script that said you know in this situation do this thing. So let's say that you know when an employee comes into my office and asks me you know presents me with a challenge in that situation, then I will give them you know options and give them solutions and give them some resources got to it. help them. Got it. Okay. Right. So that's a, that's a behavior, right? Okay. Somebody says. Houston, I got a problem. As a leader, my response is, here's yeah. a solution for how you make this round peg work in a square hole, right? Whatever. And, and there's value in that script, right? But behind that script is a belief and a set of assumptions about the world and the situation. And, and these scripts work pretty well to a certain point. 
but they're all incomplete, right? They're, they don't cover all the scenarios. So then, you know, an employee comes in and says, hey, where's the stapler? And you're like, it's over there. And you're like, okay, great. And you're like, oh, that worked. Good script. Do that script next time. <laughs> yeah. That reinforces that behavior, right? But then you get to a place where an employee is trying to bring, presenting a challenge and you're trying to solve it. And they're like, you're leading from behind. You're not beside me, mm. right? It's not working in this moment. And you're like, why isn't this working? Like you had a problem, I gave you a solution. And that, you know, that that script's not, not functioning in this situation. And I think what happens for a lot of leaders is if they see that script's not working, they try to just go directly to edit the script. Like, oh, no, well, don't do that. Do this instead. But often you you find yourself giving that guidance to somebody and it's not sticking and, you know, they keep crashing and they keep, you know, failing and they're not, you know, maybe they're not listening. And you're like, well, let me just say it louder. You know, let me repeat it. And, and you're like, it's not landing. So I might ask myself, is there a belief that that employee is carrying that is blocking their ability to upgrade that script or is blocking their ability to adopt a new behavior? If we take the example you gave a second ago where somebody comes to my office and I give them, you know, do A, B, and C. And so now I'm coaching up a leader and I say to them, when somebody comes and they ask for your help, mm-hmm. be ready with bunches of resources and, and bunches of ideas and point them in those directions. And yeah, they're yeah. applying that idea, but not getting the quality results that you're getting. Or maybe they're not fully applying the idea. Like they, they, okay. Go, they go, okay, thanks. They go out and they don't really fully do that. Okay. All right. And and I think a lot of leaders, especially in uh, professional industries, right, your engineers, your doctors, your trades folks, where they're like they're very intelligent and they're they're expert in their fields. Now they've been promoted to a position of mm-hmm. leadership. They're trying to pass along that knowledge and that wisdom to that mm-hmm. employee. Yeah. And they're like, well, just do the screwdriver this way or or do the medical procedure this way. And it's and the person's like they're not getting it. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And I think a lot of leaders then feel frustrated because they're like, what's going on here? Right. Like, I think I'm giving them the answer, but it's not working. And in that moment, that's when I've learned to recognize that it's like, OK, there is a belief that's blocking the behavior. Right. There's some belief that that person has that somehow is preventing the brain from absorbing that information. You know, and that's what revolves around all this, you know, why you coach and you ask questions, and you try to elicit these things um, is to be able to discover what's the belief that's blocking them. And the belief might be, uh, I'm too young to do this. I'm not the right person to, to do this. I, I shouldn't have to do this in order for it to work. They're like, it's not working. Like, we'll do A. And you're like, they're like, okay. But in their minds, they're like, but I shouldn't have to do A. It should just work without A. You know, you've been asked 10 times to do this. You know to do it. It's been very clear. It's causing frustration. Why are you doing it? It's like, oh, I just need to do it. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Maybe the first time, yes. But after 10 times, what's your belief? And the person was like, to be honest, I don't, I don't think I should have to do this. I don't think it's the right thing to do. I was like, aha, <laughs> that's why you're not behaving because the belief is getting in the way. So when the leader is trying to help develop somebody, right, there's who the person purports to be, there's the way the person actually behaves, there's the belief the person has, and then there's that special place inside that's their soul, right? I think as a leader who's trying to run in parallel to help unleash somebody and their proficiency with whatever their tasks are, or themselves to be a better leader, we've got to differentiate when the challenge is, yeah, they just need a new script for their behavior, you know, then then that's more of like, you know, here's the aspirin, here's the tool, here's the stapler, go get it. But if that's not working, we got to go up one more level to ask, what does that person believe about that situation? And how are those beliefs potentially blocking them from being able to perform? And that's yeah. where I think a leader can really, really add a ton of value. You're really challenging me here, Lee, in, in all the best ways, because we can talk about clients and we can talk about business. And that is what we spend most of our time talking about. But immediately right now, I'm thinking about being a father. Well, I'm thinking about the times when I'm attempting to lead my children towards something that would be good for them, at least in my Mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about it. Yeah. 15 to 20 times. And we're still having trouble getting follow through (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Am I going to pause at some point and stop doing that definition of insanity, right? And saying, okay, mm-hmm. what else is actually going on here? And what you're sharing with us is the idea that there's very possibly a belief mm-hmm. that is in the way. And we need as leaders to be curious about what that yeah. might be. And and I love to bring in the other part that we were talking about earlier. What if I was curious alongside the person in a non-judgmental yeah. way versus the way that yeah. I'm, you know, quite frankly, just to be transparent as a, as a father and 
you sometimes you see some things. I, I'm not very curious. I am, mm. I am, you know, barking a command from behind the bike because it is the twentieth time that I've asked for it, and, and I and I'm even finding and there's a time and a place for that. Like well, I, you know. Yes, you know? there is, especially if somebody's in but danger. But if that's like, not working, <laughs> yes, 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 and I have to ask myself, and I think this is this is a good parallel for all the leaders who might be listening. Ultimately, is what am I really after here? Am I really yes. after their compliance with the thing? I'm like, no, that's not what I'm really after. What I'm really after is developing the human being. I'm yes. really after helping to shape them into something that they can use down the road. So if it happens to be that we have the drop station at the front door and we're saying, everybody put your shoes in the drop station so that we're not tripping over them all the time. And it's the Mm -hmm. 17th time that that hasn't happened. Can I Mm -hmm. be non-judgmentally curious alongside my kids instead of just frustrated that they haven't put the shoes in? And is it possible that as a leader of a family that I could be up to something more than getting the shoes at the drop station? And this conversation is challenging me to keep in mind, you know, hey, Tim, in your heart of hearts, what are you really after? Are you really just after the shoes in there? And the answer is no. I'm after mm-hmm. more than that. And But sometimes I forget. I forget yeah. in my frustration. I Then I become pretty self-focused. And the narrative is I'm in charge here. I want it done. It needs to be done. And all of a sudden, I've become a tyrannical leader that's not very fun to be around. Yeah. He's just <laughs> nagging people like crazy. And and guess what kind of followership that gets? Not very effective. I don't get those big picture ends that I'm actually after, which is developing a, a high-functioning, quality human being to send out into yeah. the world. So all we are all faced with this challenge, whether it's as parents, uh, as as mentors in our community, you know, I've got nephews and nieces and other kids that I love on, you know, your employees, your customers, even, I mean, how often are we in a situation where we're trying to guide a customer who's like, help me achieve this outcome. And you're like, well, just do this. And then they won't do it. And you're like, <laughs> you're paying me to guide you and you're not doing what I'm guiding you to do, right? It's the same pattern. Mm. And to your point, you use the word compliance. The best you get through force is compliance. Yeah. If you really want to get commitment and then lifelong adoption and 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 application, then you've got to go beyond force and you got to really be able to go to a space of understanding what's limiting them and what's inspiring them. And, you know, there's the brake and the gas pedal. And if they're standing on the brake, you pushing that car ain't going to make it go boy, any faster. Boy, you're crushing the analogies, by the way. That's real. I mean, this is all stuff. <laughs> We're really familiar with and and you're and you're moving me to to think about i'm just imagining conversations that i don't have enough which mm-hmm. is how often do i pause and we'll take the simple drop station example again here at the front door that holds the shoes and the jackets and the book bags and all that if i were to say hey can i share with you why i think this is important i mean yeah. it's important in small ways around just day to day but actually there's kind of a, a bigger thing but we're working on it in a very small way and that's just follow through that's just you know, doing yeah. the thing because that's a wonderful habit for all of us to develop. That's what mm-hmm. I have in mind. Now, tell me a little bit, what are some thoughts you have about why this has been difficult to follow through on? And now I'm delivering why and showing up with non-judgmental curiosity. I'm just willing to bet as a father, I get into a better conversation that way than the things that I, that I'm frankly normally do. You, you absolutely will. You absolutely will. And that, then the why is the inspiration. So that's the energy and the fuel to be able to do it. And as important as that is, like I said, you also got to look at the impediment that might be preventing it. And that's where that limiting belief can mm-hmm. potentially you know, override even the why. You can articulate, you can ask them about it. They can say it. I mean, everybody says, you know, my, my mom was a great example of this. She was a nurse. She was healthy, a health advocate, right? But she smoked a ton. Mm -hmm. And that ended up taking her life way prematurely as a result of it. Now, the whole time she knew smoking was not good for her. And and I tried in loving ways and judgmental ways and tantrum chan ways to get her to not smoke. And like, she never would stop. And then that ended up, you know, taking many years that she could have spent with her grandkids away. Devastating, terrible. It wasn't because the why wasn't strong enough. It was because there was something else that was getting in the way. Mm -hmm. Right now, now, and now that, you know, addiction and other things, we're not going to go there. But like with your kids, Uh, or an employee, if you look at, okay, well, what's a belief that might be getting in the way of their having access to that why? And here's a specific example that might be the case. Their experience has grown up where if I just drop it here in the hallway, in my bedroom, outside the bathroom, wherever, and beliefs always have this pattern, like if this, then that, therefore, right? Mm -hmm. Right? That's the structure of it, right? If I just drop it here, then a few hours later, it magically disappears. 
<laughs> Therefore, <laughs> it is okay to drop it wherever you please, <laughs> right? And I literally, I remember having this conversation with my mom where she was laying to my brother and someone was like, but mom, you, at, you keep asking him to do this, but whenever he doesn't do it, you come right behind him and do it for him. <laughs> like you are reinforcing him not doing that, <laughs> wondering why he's not doing that. So then that leads to that therefore, which says this is an okay thing to have. So that's the belief that is behind the behavior, which is drop it wherever. And you're trying to, you know, hit the behavior in a brute force way and be like, this behavior is suboptimal for all these reasons. And they're like, yeah, but if I just do this, it works. So what's the big deal, right? And the challenge with beliefs is that they're usually partially true. Mm. And they work mm. for a really long yeah, time. And yeah. now, now fast forward from a five-year-old to a 45-year-old, yeah. and they've got this belief that's worked for 43 of them years. Yeah. And the time that it didn't, you know, they don't associate that because they're like, ah, that was an exception versus like, no, that's starting to prove that there's something mm. missing. So mm. I think the role of a leader in that moment, Tim, or as a father in this case, right, get curious to listen to it and be like, okay, what are they believing about this situation that I'm not picking up? Because maybe mm. I have a different belief, right? Yeah. Uh, and then usually if you ask them, like, okay, well, what, you know, what's your assumption about this? Or, you know, what's going on? Or how do you do it differently? You start to find out the the because Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, okay, well, that is partially true. That has been your our experience to date. And that has worked adequately, but we're trying to grow to this level or we're trying mm -hmm. to improve as a family. And so how do we then in evolve that belief to say, you know, yes, when I used to drop it here, it got picked up. However, the new evolved belief is as I grow up and I'm able to contribute more to this family, I can take on more responsibility, which results in my dad yelling at me less and getting more playtime with him. With like, <laughs> right. Or whatever the, whatever yeah. the new belief. Right. Yeah. And now it's like, oh, okay. So it was partially true, but it was incomplete. And so I think as leaders, then being able to recognize those stoppers as well as the drivers and examples of this are, you know, I'm not good enough. I don't have enough resources. We don't have enough time. The market conditions aren't right. Uh, it's not, I'm not in the right role for this. They're never going to hear it coming from, you know, a, a tall person, a short person, a skinny person, a fat person, whatever the thing <laughs> is, right? And that's been validated maybe by prior experiences where they were, you know, oppressed, suppressed, discounted. And they're like, but look, that, that is true. That happens. So don't tell me that's not a true belief. Here's what's also true is that you've got transferable knowledge and you've got a, got a lot of great reputation and you don't have the whole story, but you have part of it that it's valuable to this process, you know, so getting after it and, and offering it and doing it in this way. Now they're open to the how. Okay. Uh, I, I think I think that's the distinction I would want you know to share with your followers is that if you're trying to expand your leadership capacity, yes, do the why. Yes, do the listening. But what you're listening for also is, is there a blocking belief that's partially true that's getting in the way? And then how can you help them evolve that belief to so that then they have a greater capacity to be worth following? Mm. So what is it, you know, with all of your years of experience and engaging with people in this place in between behaviors and soul where the belief lands and sometimes stops progress, stops growth, stops achievement? Are there some examples you can think of? Are there stories where you've seen? How is it that somebody can overcome that? How is it that somebody can help somebody else overcome those limiting beliefs that get in the way? What does it look like for somebody to grow into a different way of believing that then unleashes them? I think part of it is seeing somebody model it, right? You know, it's one thing to be behind them and saying, this is what you should do. Um, and it's another thing to be in front of them and saying, well, that's what I did back then. But to literally be in the moment with you and say, hey, let's do this together. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's, you know, get it back to that same analogy. Let's do this together. Right. So you're yeah. scared of the big meeting that's coming up and how do we approach it? Let me do it with you. Or I'm going to do the parts of it that are terrifying you still to mm -hmm. show you that it's safe. And look, I'll live. Right. And then, <laughs> but then you do a part of it that is within your current capacity, but it's still below all of your total potential. Like your total potential is here, but right now your capacity is really here. Okay. So let me yep. give you the space that's here, right? Mm -hmm. And then that reinforces you and it starts to disrupt that belief. Then I can give you more, then I can give you more, then I can give you more. And that's that progressive delegation that then helps to expand it. So I think that's part of it, Tim. The other part of it is to sometimes you got to hit those beliefs head on. And so asking, is that fully and always true boy i love the fully and always right because that's because we already know it's partially true right it's been partially true enough always universally and fully 
the tr- the whole story and nothing but that, and they will be like, well, no, yeah, you, know, oh. you know, I get, I'm like, you know, yeah. and, and and then this is this is something I actually learned from Tony Robbins. He's like, well, but let's go there, right? Because we become so familiar, the law of familiarity with these beliefs, and they've served us so well. We discount the risks that these beliefs present to us because the beliefs are trying to present us from other risks. And you're like, but yeah, we've already solved for that. And you and you forget that. So to be like, okay, well, what would happen if we clung to this belief wholeheartedly for the Ooh, rest of your wow. career or the rest of your life? What would be the consequence? How would that impact or damage your goals or dreams or desires? And then it's like, well, yeah, it's like you might as well quit now. Like you're done. <laughs> You know, and and, and it, yes, you're afraid of doing this thing. Yeah. So the belief is don't do this because you'll look like a fool. You'll lose your job. You end up homeless and desolate and, and starve. Yeah. So they're protecting against that risk. I'm like, yes. And yet if you never do it, what's that going to look like? Well, you're going to end up losing your job and be homeless <laughs> and desolate and starve. So like maybe there's something in between here we can work on. So yeah. by disrupting the pattern, by revealing the risks that it has, I think that's another a key part. There's one little idea and two really big ideas that I want us to place emphasis on as we wrap up today's episode. The little idea was just a comment that Lee made really early on, and he talked about how his company works with willing learners. And I realized that he was just communicating who they like to work with. But I think there's value in considering that word learning As we consider the people that we want to invest in heavily as leaders to grow and develop, the other leaders coming behind us, this idea of who are the willing learners. I'm not saying that we should never dig in and attempt to convince or, you know, recruit people into the idea of their greater development. But there is truth in the fact that we tend to make more progress when we're investing in willing learners. And so I know that that's something that's unique to Lee's organization that they look for and lean into. But I think in that one little word, willing, there's something for us to pay attention to as leaders. Are we investing in people who are willing learners and and how do we find them and how do we make willingness a priority in how we invest in the development of others? So that's the little idea. Now, here are the two bigger ideas. We talked a lot about beliefs. We talked about this idea of the space in between soul and behavior and how are we thinking as we move forward. And what's really beautiful about how Lee sees this that we can all take a lesson from is are we willing to first recognize that we might be trying to solve a belief problem with a behavior solution. And so ultimately, we've got to match up the solution with where the problem is, which is to say, We've got to be dealing in belief solutions if it's a belief problem that we have. And so the the bigger picture of that for us as leaders is, are we willing to go there? Are we willing to have a conversation, not just about behaviors, but what is it that you really believe? And that belief might be holding you back and inviting the leaders you're investing in to be in that conversation, being willing to have a conversation, not just about behaviors but about belief and to be honest with people when you potentially run into beliefs that you think might be holding them back, but to be curious. And also Lee, through bringing up this issue of of beliefs, he's invited us not to continuously bang our head against the wall and be frustrated with the lack of results that we're getting. He's inviting us to pause and consider there might be a belief issue in this situation. So let's make sure that we're operating in belief space. So am I willing to go there as a leader? Am I willing to dig into conversations about belief with the leaders that I am investing in, that I'm growing and developing? And then finally, there is this big idea of running alongside leaders, um, being with them in the process. That is to say, I'm developing these leaders as they come up in the organization, or it could be not even in leadership roles, depending on your level in the organization. It could be I'm developing performance in the organization, either way. But as I come alongside them, in that that beautiful, wonderful picture around helping somebody to learn to ride a bike, I think most of us can imagine what that would look like in our minds, even if we didn't individually have that experience. And you see what a 
what a great picture that is. And so this idea of how do I have my hand on the seat and when do I take it off? And how do I look at the terrain ahead and say, well, you know what, even if this goes sideways, it's not going to be fatal for the person who's leading. That that is the person riding the bike. It's not going to be fatal for the organization. We'll work through it. So this is a great time for me to kind of take my hand. But this idea that I love the picture of his dad running alongside, you know, that's a that's such a such a motivational picture to me as we think about how are we showing up as leaders? Are we with people as opposed to just barking orders from behind or way out front? And it's, and, it, and it's not to say that there's never a time to give an order. And it's not to say there isn't a time to be out front and have people just do what I'm doing. There are times for that, for sure. But is there space in where you're leading where you are actually sprinting alongside somebody, putting in that effort to be with them, to get them up and going, to get them up to speed, and then carefully taking your hand off the bike. I love that picture, and I think it's challenging for all of us. So that leads me to the question I want to leave you with today, and that is this. When you think about that learning to ride the bike analogy, you can see that picture of the adult who's running alongside the individual who is getting their bearings, who is trying to learn how to ride that bike. When you think about the leaders who are taking the next step in their careers, do you see yourself running alongside them? Are you running alongside leaders as you help them take these next steps and do the next thing? Are you sprinting beside anybody? If not, you should be, and so should I. This is Tim Spiker reminding you to be worth following and to follow us wherever you receive your podcasts. If you've heard something valuable today, please share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. And if you're up for it, leave us a five-star review. Thanks for listening.